Welcome everybody to our ICMDA webinar. This is the fifth in the series and today we're privileged to have Dr. James Haslam speaking to us on critical care for COVID-19 uh, patients. Now, uh, my name is Dr. Peter Saunders. I'm the CEO of ICMDA. So it's our pleasure today to introduce Dr. James Haslam, who is a consultant in anesthesia and intensive care medicine based in Salisbury in the United Kingdom. He's married with three children. He likes, we believe, movies and cycling, and he's got interests in critical care, advanced ventilation, medical education, philosophy, ethics, Christian theology, and apologetics. And he's a member of the Christian Medical Fellowship in the UK. So pleasure to have you James and over to you. Okay well welcome um, all the, the listeners. Thank you for joining us this afternoon and thank you for having me give this presentation. Um, as Peter said I'm, I'm James Haslam. I'm an anaesthetist and intensivist in Salisbury in Wiltshire in uh, southern England in the United Kingdom and uh, this is a talk on um, critical care for COVID-19 patients. Just thought I'd start with this passage from Matthew 25, verse 40. This is Jesus speaking. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So I just wanted to um, encourage all you um, doctors and dentists and medical students, whoever else is listening, that um, the enterprise that we're involved in as, as um, healthcare professionals working in, in this field is, is, a, is a really noble one and Jesus endorses it that when we're caring for people afflicted with diseases such as COVID-19 that um, we can consider that our patients are we're caring for Jesus himself and, um, and I just wanted to encourage you and bless you well done for all you're doing and keep safe hopefully you'll learn something from this presentation. So we're going to start with some epidemiology um, Coronavirus disease 2019, also co called COVID-19, um, is caused by the virus SARS-CoV-2, and it was first reported in Wuhan in China towards the end of 2019. Cases are now reported all over the world in every continent except Antarctica. It is a highly infectious disease, and it's thought to be transmitted through droplet transmission. Um, and the droplets, uh, are thought not to travel more than one to two meters, um, but it's, it's thought that uh, patients can be asymptomatic and still um, cause transmission, and hence why it's been so infectious. It has a case fatality rate that varies, um, and I think it's still being calculated, uh, but it's around the order of one to five percent, um, though most patients, the vast majority, have a mild illness. Risk factors for um, increased mortality include coronary heart disease, hypertension, dialysis dependence, kidney failure, chronic respiratory disease, immunosuppression, malignancy, and increasing age. There's a correlation with increasing age, and particularly those over the age of 60 years, 70, 80 years are m much more susceptible to be getting um, serious DL and from, from dying. And the severe illness is characterized by a viral pneumonia or pneumonitis with acute respiratory distress syndrome. And you can also get other organ dysfunctions. And if this is present, patients are likely to require hospitalization and they may need hospitalization for quite a prolonged period of time. That's our experience in here in the UK. Critically ill patients have a high mortality rate of the order of 50%. One in two patients can die if they're critically ill. And that's even in high income countries such as the United Kingdom. And treatment is largely conservative and supportive. And we're going to talk about that. So the next couple of slides are the main take home messages I'd like for you to um, uh, understand and, and sort of hopefully they'll resonate with you. Um, I think the important thing is that, that this is a, a, a huge pandemic with a really high demand and potentially the demand can well outstrip the resources that we have in our healthcare settings to, to meet that demand. And as such, we should really focus on doing the greatest good for the greatest number of patients. We want to try and uh, treat and uh, save the lives of, of, of as many patients as possible. And um, if you look at this, this uh, diagram here, you can see that 80% um, of patients have a, only a mild presentation and may not even require hospitalization. And then the other 20% can be quite unwell. 
um, with three quarters of those hospitalized patients uh, requiring sort of ward level care and oxygen therapy and only a quarter of the hospitalization hospitalized patients so five percent of the total um, are really critically ill and require advanced care in, in an ICU or critical care setting and mechanical ventilation. So what this shows though is that the vast majority of patients you can um, treat either um, um, for, uh, in the community or in hospital in a ward level setting. So you can do a lot of good by focusing on those patients and even if you don't have the resources to be able to treat those who require advanced care and, and mechanical ventilation and organ support, which consumes vast amounts of resources and is really labor intensive. Um, so I just wanted to reassure you that you can do a lot of good even with little resources. This is the next take home slide. Um, and that the focus really needs to be on doing the basics well. Uh, I, we'll cover all these topics, but um, the, the, the headlines are that you need to think about seriously about infection prevention and control about providing good quality nursing care, which includes comfort and positioning, nutrition and fluids and symptom management. As physicians, we really need to be um, on the front foot of preparing, planning, training and simulation. And I'll, I'll show you some resources that can be used for that. Um, thinking about oxygen supplies and delivering oxygen. You may have not have come across it, but conscious proning is a very useful technique to help prevent progression of disease and requiring more advanced techniques. We'll think about some other pathologies that can present and we'll also talk about palliative care. So if you focus on these basics and you do those well, you, you, you'll have some great outcomes and you'll, you'll, you'll see a lot of patients um, doing well. So in terms of preparation, um, we, we have just seen, we're in the tail end of our first wave in the UK. I don't know where you are in terms of your progression of your pandemic where you are. Um, but what we did in terms of preparation and potentially what you could prepare for your setting or even for your second wave is to um, think about um, increasing capacity and particularly ward level capacity but it also critical care if you're able to and um, so we need to look at um, how many bed spaces we have uh, oxygen supplies and equipment to deliver that oxygen um, and think about oxygen um, consumption and whether our oxygen capacity is enough to meet that demand um, other equipment, including personal protective equipment, and we'll talk about the kinds of PPE that are useful. And then think about pharmacy stores, your stocks of drugs um, for, for uh, ward level patients, for critical care patients, and particularly for palliating patients well. You'll need to have adequate stocks of drugs for that. And then in terms of training staff, um, our experience is that we've had to uh, we've had an influx of staff from the rest of the hospital to come and help us in critical care and on our acute medical unit. And so they're, they're going to be staff that, who are unfamiliar with that environment. And so it can be really quite daunting for them. And so they you ha we have had to provide some training for cross skilling so that we can skill them up to be able to uh, be useful in our areas. We've, we've had to think about task orientated teams. So having um, teams that can go around and do a set task for multiple patients. Um, uh, so, for example, uh, in, in our critical care setting, that would be proning patients, turning and, and moving patients, cleaning patients. And also we've had an intubation team on call 24 seven to uh, intubate critically ill patients. And, uh, and so we've had dedicated teams and it means you can use uh, less staff to achieve the same ends uh, by having teams that do specific tasks. Uh, it's, it may well be the case that you have to relax your staffing ratios um, and as, as such, your regular staff and particularly those from other areas are going to feel quite outside the comfort zone and feel quite daunted. And so um, that's why it's important to have the right policies and procedures in place. Um, and also to think about simulation uh, and preparing videos to help train the, the staff that are coming to help you. Um, examples that we've used is that we've had videos preparing people to, to don and doff uh, PPE well and um, so that they have good quality technique and they're less likely to contaminate themselves or other patients and um, in terms of airway management I'll come on to talk about that later uh, but that's a great um, example of a topic that you can use to help uh, train your your teams using simulation getting these um, preparation topics right is really important because it will make the difference between your teams being afraid and hesitant or um, 
if you train them well, they'll feel confident and comfortable, and then they're able to be, they'll be able to deliver high quality care. So coming on to the look at the clinical features, um, I've split these into adults and children. Um, fever is a common presentation, along with a suspected respiratory infection. Plus one of these features, a elevated respiratory rate, severe respiratory distress, altered mental status, or hypoxia, SATs less than 94% on room air. And for children similar, cough or difficulty breathing, uh, central cyanosis, hypoxia, severe respiratory distress, and things like uh, elevated respiratory rate, appropriate for the age of the child, grunting, severe accessions, and signs of pneumonia with general, general danger signs, such as inability to feed or breastfeed or drink, lethargy, and in very serious cases, unconsciousness and convulsions. And they're obviously worrying, very worrying signs. Now, you'll notice that these are fairly non-specific features and can be the case for multiple conditions, uh, including other respiratory conditions other than COVID. But you'll find that um, as the numbers of COVID patients increases in your area, these will become um, more prevalent and uh, you need to be very suspicious if these features are present that your patient may have COVID-19. So in terms of diagnosis, we've talked about a clinical presentation and those features that might indicate that they have um, COVID-19, but radiological um, features can also be uh, suggestive and helpful in, in, in diagnosing your patients. So if you, ha if you have a chest X-ray available, um, and sometimes CT chest, we don't always do a CT chest, but if, for those patients who we're worried about or um, uh, are borderline, that could be a useful modality. And not all, but most patients will have classical features such as symmetrical bilateral airspace or pacification or consolidation, and they may have ground glass change. And this is an example I found uh, on a teaching um, uh, seminar uh, with, uh, some of these, this bilateral airspace of pacification is particularly based on peripheral and it's bilateral. And that's a, cl a classical mild picture and, it, and the, the airspace of pacification and patchy infiltrates will get worse as, with a worse, worsening presentation. And it, but you'll have a similar appearance on CT chest, but it can be more sensitive. Um, imaging can also be used to triage patients. So if, you, if you're waiting for a, a, a PCR test to come back um, and thinking about whether to um, isolate or cohort your patients, um, imaging the chest can help you in de deciding whether uh, the, the, the risk of, of this patient having COVID-19 and whether you need to isolate or cohort the patient. Um, and it also uh, may reveal other diagnoses. So in terms of laboratory tests, the gold standard is the nasopharyngeal swab, or if the patient's intubated and ventilated, a tracheal aspirate is, is better. And you send that for reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction assay, which is a gold standard test, but it has a limited sensitivity and that varies according to different laboratories and assays. Um, so that means that a negative test does not necessarily mean the patient um, hasn't got COVID-19. It doesn't necessarily exclude them. And so if, if you have a, an index of suspicion or um, uh, you, you really think the patient may still have COVID-19, it's worth repeating that test or just treating them as, as though they have, have, have it um, in the time being. In terms of other tests, lymphopenia is very common. Um, as it says here, 83% of patients will have low lymphocytes on their full blood count. Other biochemical features are an elevated uh, CRP, C-reactive protein, um, LDH can be elevated as well as a D-dimer ferritin, and uh, they can be hypo, hypoalbuminemic as well, low albumin. So as I say, maintain a high index of suspicion and err on the side of caution if you think the patient may have COVID-19. And this is a link here. I've shortened the links to hopefully make them easier to put into your web browser. Um, you can either take a note, and I think um, Peter will make this uh, presentation available uh, later for those who have listened and maybe even on YouTube. But if you, if you use um, this uh, URL, it'll link to a radiology decision tool, which will help you stratify the risk for patients according to their radiology. So moving on to infection prevention and control. Simple surgical face masks on a patient reduces the spread of virus to staff and patients. And that can be key, especially if you're short of PPE, 
if you put a face mask on a patient, that can really help uh, prevent that droplet transmission. And you can use it underneath an oxygen mask. Um, so that can be uh, a, very useful. Um, ideally, we need to isolate or cohort positive patients if possible. And we need to think about PPE for our staff. Um, frequent ha thorough hand washing is very important. And our donning and doffing technique with training and simulation is something that we focused on in the early part of our pandemic um, in order to get our staff um, uh, familiar with and with good technique for donning and doffing their PPE. This is an example of the UK PHE guidance on what PPE to wear for different settings. So for general contact with confirmed or possible COVID-19 cases, you have um, eye, eye protection according to risk assessment, a food resistant surgical mask, a disposable apron and gloves. And then for high risk aer aerosol generating procedures or in high risk areas such as critical care, intensive care, HDU, uh, where there's lots of these aerosol generating procedures, then staff should really be wearing eye protection all the time, such as a shield or goggles, um, an FFP2 or 3 mask, a filtering mask, a respirator, a long sleeve fluid repellent gown and gloves. And they should really be long gloves that cover your sleeves so that there's no gap for your wrist. Uh, and then we also need to think about decontamination and disinfection of our equipment and our environment. And you can use 10% alcohol or hypochlorite solution. Um, and if, if you um, follow the links to the CDC or the PHE guidance, they'll have more information. This is just a, 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 to summarize that. But this is really important to protect your staff, yourselves, and also other patients from transmission of this um, horrible virus. So moving on to nursing and allied professional care. Um, it's really important that our teams are providing really good quality care, including mouth care, patient positioning and turns, um, so that patients can ventilate optimally and so that we are paying attention to pressure areas and preventing pressure sores. Uh, physios and, and other staff can help with chest physiotherapy and functioning and thinking about fever management, antipyretics such as paracetamol we found useful and cool towels. When you think about the nutrition of our patients and encourage oral fluids and nutrition in those patients who can tolerate that. Um, nutritionally complete drinks such as 40 sips can be useful when patients are struggling with um, normal diet. And for those patients who really are struggling with respiratory distress or on a lot of oxygen, you can think about using nasogastric feeding to supplement their, their calorie intake uh, while they're poorly and, and unable to take oral intake. And we want to try and avoid constipation, which can be distressing for patients and affect their ventilation. So think about using laxatives liberally. Moving on to the re management of acute respiratory failure. The, the key, key um, uh, take home message here is, is oxygen and antimicrobials. Conscious proning we'll also talk about. But I just want to talk here about non-invasive ventilation. So there's been quite a lot of um, use of continuous positive airway pressure in Italy. And we've, we, we followed that advice in the UK and have used a lot of CPAP, which has been really beneficial for lots of the, the more sick patients. Um, some centers are using high flow nasal cannula for that purpose as well, uh, with a, as a non-invasive ventilation modality. You have to be careful with these modalities though, because they can consume large quantities of oxygen, up to 60 liters a minute. And when you have lots of patients on these modalities, that can really consume lots of oxygen, and you're, you may struggle to, to meet that demand with your um, oxygen delivery systems. There's also a risk that these modalities can aerosolize the virus. And so ideally patients using um, non-invasive ventilation techniques should be in a side room or in cohorted areas with the staff there in full PPE. So that's the, the level uh, three masks, the F FFP3 masks. CPAP may not be tolerated by all patients uh, for the length of time required, which can be for, for several days, even weeks. And um, again, different interfaces can be more comfortable than others. We don't have access to hoods in our unit, um, but uh, some patients have tolerated face masks well, others less so. And then there's obviously there's invasive ventilation. If you have that capability in your critical care area, then um, we'll talk about that too. So again, I just want to remind you that if you have a lot of patients on oxygen, you'll be using a lot of oxygen. And so uh, you need to think about your monitoring your supply and trying to ma maximize your capacity to be able 
be able to deliver oxygen and conserving that oxygen by tar targeting saturations of 92 to 94 percent if you're able to measure the sats. So this is just a reminder of how much oxygen you can deliver with various interfaces, so nasal prongs, 28 to 40 percent, a nasopharyngeal catheter, 45 to 60 percent, a face mask, 6 to 10 litres will give you 44 to 60 percent, and then a reservoir mask, around 85 percent of 15 litres, and then a venturi. Um, again, variable according to the venturi um, device you have attached, but 24 to 60 percent. So thinking about antimicrobials and other treatments, um, there's been lots of press about novel antiviral treatments, experimental therapies and steroids, but th so far there's very little evidence base for those. Um, we are part of some research trials in, in the UK and only patients that are part of the research trials were giving these, these treatments. Um, apart from steroids, we've had one patient so far that we've um, thought is, uh, has required steroids and actually they didn't make a difference, but that's in the later part of the course of the treatment. And um, I wouldn't recommend it routinely uh, until we have more evidence base to support that. Again, think about other bacteria or viruses such as influenza as co-infections or other diagnoses. And so use antibiotics or antivirals according to your local guidance and according to your diagnostics. So this is a, a potential novel technique that has been used much more during this pandemic. Uh, we, we, again, we had um, uh, advice from our Italian colleagues to, to use this, and it's been very useful in helping prevent people from progressing to uh, needing invasive ventilation. And basically, with patients who are, have got a significant oxygen requirement um, and are able to, uh, you can get them to lie on the front um, and prone themselves, and that way you improve their ventilation perfusion matching, alveolar recruitment and gas exchange. And so they end up requiring less oxygen and have less of a need for uh, more invasive ventilation. So you'll need to consider this in patients who are, you can communicate with, that they can rotate independently and have no anticipated airway issues and that there are no contraindications for. And uh, this is a link to um, some UK guidance on this technique, conscious pronation or proning, um, which you can look up and we'll have more information and also the contraindications. So in terms of airway management, for those patients who require invasive ventilation, um, intubation and ventilation is a high risk uh, time, probably the, the highest risk time in the patient's journey for aerosolization and therefore risk to your, you and your, your team and to uh, others around the patient. So this is the sort of eventuality you need to prepare well for and um, uh, there's some useful resources if you follow this link that's to the uh, a really great website put together by the Intensive Care Society, the Royal College of Anesthetists and some other organisations um, that will give you some resources to be able to help train your teams well so that they can do this properly. So this, this is an example of a human factors infographic with different things to think about. And this is an example of a tracheal intubation checklist um, so that you can prepare your equipment and um, use appropriate techniques to intubate your patient and then um, thinking about things to do afterwards as well. So have a look at those. That, that we've used those uh, lots and I've used these to train um, general anaesthetists in, in intubating these critically ill patients because we've had to use those, our colleagues as a resource as well, as intensivists. Again, it's a, it's a high risk period, an aerosol generating procedure. And um, you need to think about really using your PPE properly. If you have insufficient PPE, then um, I'd recommend thinking about using a clear plastic sheet as a barrier and intubating under the sheet to help prevent droplet transmission as best you can. Um, simulation is key to getting this right and to getting good outcomes and keeping your team safe. And so here's another resource, Vital Anesthesia Simulation Training. Um, which gives resources for, for conducting simulation. You can um, simulate using a volunteer or if you have a, a, a mannequin, using a mannequin. Um, obviously, if it's a volunteer, you'll probably not be intubating them, but you can go through the motions and, and practice and that way get your technique right so that you can um, prepare well and you can get your teams practicing using the PPE because doing these techniques with full PPE is tricky and it needs practice. In terms of ventilation strategy for invasive ventilation, I'd recommend, I would recommend using a protocol, but individualizing that protocol to your patient. Um, and here's an example of an algorithm 
that um, our colleagues in London at Geyser St. Thomas's have put together. They're a severe respiratory failure center with vast experience treating very difficult patients. Um, and they've had hundreds, I think probably around 200 ventilated uh, COVID-19 patients so far in this pandemic. And this is their approach to that algorithm, which I think is really sensible um, and it's, it's uh, common sense and straightforward. So this is what I would recommend. There are others out there and you might want to tailor them to your specific situation. Here's a link, to a Twitter link to this one, um, which uh, is similar to our, our approach in Salisbury. Uh, it's important to remember that patients may require ventilation for some weeks. Uh, we've had patients ventilated for two, three, four, um, four weeks so far. Um, there, it's a very difficult condition to treat and patients can be very difficult to ventilate and wean. And we've had many patients prone, some for, for a couple of weeks, um, for, for sort of uh, 16 hours prone overnight. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really quite tricky. Thinking about cardiovascular support, um, we need to maintain uvolemia and try and keep our patients in sinus rhythm. Avoid atrial fibrillation if you can, preventatively, and also treating it when, when those patients go into atrial fibrillation. Here are some drugs to think about there. We want to maintain an adequate perfusion pressure above 60 millimeters of mercury. And if you, if you uh, struggle to find supplies of um, vasopressors and inotropes, you can think about maybe trying to get a hold of oral agents, such as midodrine, which can increase your systemic vascular resistance using an oral agent. Um, as well, you need to maintain an adequate hemoglobin, ideally above 70 grams per litre, so that you can um, maintain your oxygen delivery. In terms of fluid management, um, this is something that has um, sort of become more clear over the course of the weeks, but you need to try and get that sweet spot, that Goldilocks sweet spot, where you have enough fluid to present worsening of any kidney injury, but not too much that you worsen the lung injury and the gas exchange. And so it's trying to get that just right which can be tricky, especially without advanced sort of um, cardiac output um, monitors. Uh, but you can use simple techniques such as a central peripheral temperature gradient and using a straight leg raise using um, uh, and seeing their response on the hemodynamics, heart rate and blood pressure according to the leg raise to assess whether they might be fluid responsive. And then um, give boluses to achieve um, your hemodynamic parameters rather than um, using infusions because you're more likely to drift into a, a significant positive balance which you want to try and avoid and patients are able to give um, enteral oral and nasogastric fluids um, otherwise intravenous fluids remember to record your your fluid balance in your critical care areas and remember that there can be significant volumes of drugs and you need to add those into your balance to so try and keep a more neutral, just slightly positive balance rather than very positive because patients can run into trouble by worsening their chest. And um, balance crystalloids such as Hartman's and Ring is what we tend to use. Um, and we also need albumin for following osmotic pressure in those patients who um, uh, ECGs are quite leaky. Um, and if you have access to albumin, that could be useful. Uh, si vous avez accès à l'albumine, la, uh, il faudra aussi donner pour que vous, ne, vous puissiez garder les, les fluides, les balances des fluides. Thrombose est aussi fréquent et environ un tiers des patients. Use strict pharmacological thrombosis prophylaxis if you can, and even consider using higher doses than normal. And some centers are using full anticoagulation. Um, for these patients because they're at such high risk of developing thromboses. Patients can be prone to developing a myocardial injury and arrhythmic complications and so that's quite more common in those patients with previous cardiac comorbidities and more severe disease. So um, be aware of that and, and try to avoid drug interactions that might prompt arrhythmias Closely monitor your patients if you can to try and detect those patients who are having cardiac uh, issues. Moving on to renal support. Um, around a third of patients who require advanced respiratory support develop the need for renal replacement therapy here in the UK. And that could be for a median of four days. Remember, these patients are hypercoagulable and so they consume their hema filters very frequently. And so as such, global stocks of hemofiltration sets and disposables and fluids are in very short supply and they're basically being rationed. 
So we need to conserve those stocks as best we can and, and do that by maximizing our filter duration. Our filters um, are designed and licensed to last for 72 hours for three days. And we try and maximize that three days by um, uh, using uh, techniques to preserve the filter. So uh, continuous vena venous hemofiltration is preferred to hemodialysis because it preserves the filter life as well as pre-dilution. Um, although it means less efficient uh, hemofiltration, um, it will preserve your filter life. And patients, um, unless they're contraindicated, we systemically anticoagulate them, as well as using any regional anticoagulation in the filter um, itself to help preserve the life. And if you, if you don't have access to um, uh, hemofiltration, then peritoneal dialysis is, is, a, is an option for those with expertise and, and the resources to be able to do, the, to do that. So just uh, to moving towards the end now, we're going to talk about um, escalation and palliative care. This is um, a, a very nasty disease and those who become critically ill with COVID-19, especially those over the age of 70, um, they can have a mortality of, of 70%. So that's critically ill patients over age 70 have a mortality of 70% and that's in the UK in quite an advanced healthcare system. So it's, a, it's a really quite a terrible disease. And so we need to be thinking about which patients are appropriate to escalate to critical care and what their patient, the patient's wishes are, what their previous comorbidities are, and their functional status, what they're able to do before they became unwell, and how d severe their current disease is when deciding about appropriate levels of escalation. We need to tailor that to the individual patient on a case-by-case -case basis. High demand for scarce resources, um, can make these decisions even more challenging as you, you're having to triage patients according to the resources you have. And this can be a big burden on yourself and your teams. So you need to think about well-being and how to encourage your teams and support them through these challenging times. Some patients are highly unlikely to survive. And so we need to think about giving them the best quality end of life care possible. And that means thinking about holistic palliative care, including spiritual care and ensuring that we give good quality palliative care with anticipatory treatments to, to preempt respiratory and other distressing symptoms to try and give them the best, best death possible. Critically ill patients with COVID-19 can take weeks to be liberated from organ support and even more weeks, further weeks for readiness for discharge from hospital. And a critical illness can have many serious consequences sequelae and these can include very severe fatigue and some patients never recover to their previous level of health even if they survive so this can be really quite a significant drain of resources um, and you need to think about that when planning ahead uh, because some patients will require multiple um, multidisciplinary uh, interventions to help in the, them in their rehabilitation which can take quite some time weeks and months so just to recap with the headlines we can do a lot of good by focusing on the patients who we can best treat and um, thinking about that, that chunk of patients, 95% who won't need critical care and think about maximizing our ward level care and ability to deliver oxygen. You'll save lots of lives if you can increase that. Obviously, we want to try and uh, meet the needs of the critical, crit critically ill patients as well as we can, the 5%, but that, that's going to consume lots of resources and not, not everywhere will be able to have that. But if you can focus on these patients, you'll be, you'll be doing a lot of good. And in terms of um, the main headlines, we need to focus on doing the basics well, infection prevention and control, good quality nursing care, preparing well, planning, training, simulation, delivering oxygen according to the severity of the illness. Conscious proning is a useful technique to help people getting, stop them getting worse. Thinking about other pathologies and giving high quality palliative care. I understand there's been another ICMDA uh, webinar on palliative care, so that'll be worth listening into as well. So just to, to conclude, I just want to remind you that like Aaron, we are called to intercede, to stand between the living and the dead, to face this plague both practically and prayerfully. Like Jesus, we're called to love the outcasts, with the proper protection, we can reach out and touch them and treat them like family. Do not be afraid, Jesus holds the keys to death. He's with you in this crisis. And we need to lead by example, inspire our teams to care for these COVID-19 patients well. Jesus is a great physician and there's no physician like him.
Here's some links to useful resources. I've mentioned this one several times. This is our UK uh, um, a site of combined resources from all sorts of specialities. And this is an international site with resources that might be more specific to lower resource settings uh, that I thought I'd link to as well. Okay, that's, that's finished. I think it's time for questions. Thank you very much, James. Wow, that was a whistle stop to a, of a huge amount of stuff. And so let's move on to the questions. And the first one, uh, Dr. Haslam, uh, this is a question about laboratory facilities and the practicalities of, of where you uh, measure uh, these things. So what mm. type of laboratory do you do the blood chemistry samples and electrolytes, urea, creatinine, and so on? Do you, do you uh, use the central hospital laboratory or do you have a special uh, device uh, or devices set up in the isolation ward? Is it, is it advisable for such samples to be done in a special place rather than the general lab? Okay. So our, our normal setup in, in our hospital is that we have a, a blood gas machine on our ICU where we do um, sort of uh, point of care testing and that has limited biochemistry on it such as sodium, um, potassium and acid base status, haemoglobin, that kind of thing. Um, we also have a, a laboratory on site where most of our blood tests are, uh, are, are processed um, and in the early part of the pandemic we had to send off our PCR tests for COVID diagnosis to our regional centre in Bristol. Um, but uh, we've actually got the technology to be able to do that on site now, and that's been validated. So we're getting a, a quicker turnaround. We normally get a same day result of our COVID-19 diagnosis, the, the SARS-CoV-2 PCR. Um, so, and that patients who are COVID-19 positive, we, we use a Daniels box to transfer the bloods, um, which is to help prevent transmission by, by contaminated samples. Um, uh, but most of the bloods are tested on site in our hospital, but that will depend on the resources available in your hospital, and you have to check your local procedures for that. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now, obviously, to provide the upper end critical care, you need a huge degree of skill, training and equipment. And many of those who are listening will not be in a situation where they have access to this. And so what advice would you have uh, to, to uh, people working in a community or in a, perhaps a rural hospital without access to, to um, high end critical care? What, 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 mm. can they real, what should they realistically focus on? Okay, um, well, hopefully we've addressed some of that with the presentation, but I guess to reiterate, I would say that you can only do what you can do. Um, you, you can only um, treat patients with the resources you have available to you. And if, if you don't have the resources, there's not much you can do about that. Um, so I think you have to try and be a bit philosophical about it and, and try and just do your best with what you have. Um, you know, as Christians, we can be prayerful about this. Uh, Jesus multiplied um, uh, two loaves and five fish or uh, whatever it was in, in to be able to feed thousands. So we can be prayerful that God can help us to uh, maximize our resources to treat as many patients as we can. Um, but if you have, if you don't have access to advanced um, organ supportive therapies that we have um, fortunate to have in our, in our place in the UK, then um, you just have to do what you can, which is uh, doing the basics well, um, giving oxygen, uh, doing things like conscious proning um, so that you help prevent people from getting that sick. And it's important to remember that patients who do become sick, it's very high mortality. So even those of us who have access to these really advanced technologies and, and high resource critical care, um, there will still be lots of patients who die in spite of all our efforts. Um, and it's, it's, it's around about 50% mortality for all comers who are critically ill in UK ICUs. And if, if as I said, if, if you're over 70, 70% 70, 70 or even more patients um, are likely to die. And, and so even with the, the advanced technologies, lots of patients will die. This is a very nasty disease. So I think don't beat yourself up about it. You've just got to do what you can do. And I guess uh, relating to palliative care as well and, and lower resource yeah. settings, you'd be using palliative care where in higher yeah. resource settings, you might be using ventilators. That's true. 
so for patients who um, you can't escalate to um, more advanced um, technologies, then those are the patients who may well need good quality palliative care instead. Um, and we are, even in the UK where we have access to ICU and we haven't ex exceeded capacity so far, um, there are patients who that's appropriate for, who we think just would not tolerate um, uh, the, 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 the level of intervention and the burden that comes with um, uh, being put on ventilators and requiring organ support. You have to have a, a physiological reserve to be able to tolerate that, and not all patients will. And so it's, it's entirely appropriate to give people end-of-life care, palliative care, and we ought to give them the best palliative care we can. And so that threshold will be different in lower resource settings and, and probably will be lower. Um, but that's, that's okay. That's, that's just what, what it has to be. So question about plasma treatments, uh, which are being used in some countries. Uh, are they being used in the UK? And, and uh, some comments about their effectiveness, the evidence for that, and the indications for using them? So I, I'm not an expert on this by any means. Um, I, know that, I know there's some in encouraging early signs that this can be useful. Um, uh, so convalescent plasma as a treatment and um, our hospital is part of a, a, a research trial where we're just introducing an arm that will um, will randomize patients to be involved with uh, either having convalescent plasma or not. Um, and now it might be that our, our center isn't isn't picked as, as one of the, the units where they where they, that happens. I, I suspect they may use higher um, higher. Uh, capacity centres, uh, maybe a te teaching hospitals, um, because uh, setting that up as a, as a, as a, um, a in, in every hospital will be difficult, um, because obviously they'll need to recruit the patients to get the convalescent plasma and have the, the correct storage facilities for that and, and to be able to administer that. But it's, it's encouraging that that potentially might be an option, but it's early days to say whether it's definitely a panacea. Um, so I think we'll have to watch and wait with that. How long can the symptoms last for COVID-19, uh, both, both uh, in terms of how long people might be requiring moderate or critical care and also how long they can last after hospital? So our, our experience is that critically ill patients tend to be with us for around about two weeks. There are some who will be less a week, but there's, we've had some patients who have been with us over a month. Um, that's in critical care they'll be, and they'll be in, in hospital for several weeks if not a couple of months so th it's a, it's a disease that takes a long time to recover from if you do recover um, and as I said pa patients will need some weeks or even months of rehabilitation after a critical, critical illness um, those patients with a mild illness can um, be asymptomatic they can um, take uh, a week or two to get over their symptoms and some patients even with milder symptoms um, can have fatigue and things like that for some weeks even a month um, so it's it does take its toll and patients will have varying um, lengths of duration of their symptoms um, but hopefully that gives you a flavor thank you a more technical question here uh Hang on. Um, do you do you have a time limit or any param parameters besides ROCS ROX to consider in changing the HNFC modality to mechanical ventilation? Okay. So, at what point do we decide to intubate people and put them on invasive ventilation? Um, I guess that that's a crowd. I'm not sure what they mean by ROCS, but um, uh, I, I guess. It's a it's a, a judgment call, and that it takes experience to know um, what time is right. It's important to say that patients who end up on ventilators generally don't do too well, and and it's worth trying to avoid that if you can. But patient, if you have that as a, available to you, there are patients who will require it, and you don't want to do it too late so that they they they're in a bit of a heat by the time they go onto a ventilator. So um, I think. Yes, our, our experience is that we, we try and um, eke people through using non-invasive ventilation such as CPAP and we started to use a bit of high flow nasal cannula. We didn't early on in the pandemic because we were concerned about aerosolization and oxygen consumption, uh, but currently we ha don't have too many patients, so we're able to offer that as a, as a treatment. Um, and. Uh, 
and, and patients tolerate high flow nasal cannula very well and for the duration uh, often they can get away with that alone but there will be patients who tire so if you need to think about respiratory rate if their respiratory rate is getting above 30 30 to 40 and they're looking tired that's probably an indicator that they may need to go onto a ventilator um, that you need to think about the degree of hypoxia, how much oxygen they're on, and you don't want to leave it to the last minute so that they're on 90% oxygen um, and you're intubating someone uh, in a difficult scenario with PPE or who's on 90 or 100% oxygen because that will make it more of a hairy, life-threatening experience for the patient and, and for you <laughs> potentially. So I would say um, try, and, try and avoid that you need to try and be intubating people when they're on 70 80 percent oxygen and um, and before they get exhausted so again you want to try and get calibrate your decision so that you you don't intubate people who don't need it but you're doing it early enough that they don't fall in a heap okay just a question about cardiological complications because you mentioned myocardial infarction and arrhythmias how often do these happen and uh, how how does one prepare to recognize and, and treat them? So um, I guess thrombotic complications, uh, as I said, are, are very common in this disease. So you need to have an index of suspicion for them um, and, uh, and try and prevent them by using robust anticoagulation and uh, prophylaxis. Um, but uh, so in terms of myocardial infarction, I don't think we've had a patient with one, but again, um, our patients are all uh, on three lead ECG and we do regular 12 lead ECGs to look out for this sort of thing. Um, so uh, again, you're going to be screening patients looking for ca cardiac ischemia. Um, uh, but in terms of thrombosis, um, pulmonary embolism is another complication. These patients also have uh, invasive lines often for central venous access and for, uh, for um, vascas for their renal replacement therapy and they're prone to clotting as well um, as, as the other thrombotic complications I talked about. And so you have to um, use your clinical acumen to, to spot those patients and to investigate them using CTPAs or whatever modality it is that you use to be able to um, diagnose ultrasound um, so that you can uh, try and screen the patients who, who are at risk um, of thrombotic complications and then you can treat them appropriately. If you'd just like to comment on, on uh, screening and swabbing staff uh, who are involved in caring for moderately or critically ill patients, how often you do it and what your indications are? So cu our current practice, um, I think generally in the UK, but certainly here in Salisbury, is that uh, staff don't routinely get screened and uh, you're only uh, tested if you're symptomatic or a member of your household is symptomatic um, and uh, uh, even that in the early parts of the pandemic um, wouldn't necessarily get a test because of the shortage of tests but now that, that they've become um, more readily available um, I think it's fairly straightforward through our, your occupational health department to get um, yourself or your family tested if you're symptomatic. If you're asymptomatic, then uh, current practice is that, that staff don't get screened. Um, but that may differ in other settings around the world. I'm not sure about that. Just a question about fever. Is fever invariably present in critically ill patients? And is its absence uh, no, it's, a, a good it's prognostic common. sign? Hmm. It, it's common. Um, but it's not invariable. Um, certain patients do not uh, develop a fever. And I'm, I, I wouldn't know for sure whether it's a good sign or not. Um, I think I'm, I'd be agnostic about that. I think it probably, um, I'm not sure that it would, it would be promising or not, but it, it certainly isn't ubiquitous, but it's common. With aerosol producing procedures, uh, is is a face shield enough or, or do you really need goggles? Uh, so, we, yeah, we use a face shield um, uh, or goggles. And most, most of the time we're using a face shield uh, with a, our respirator underneath. And, and that's adequate according to our UK PHE guidance. Now, obviously, there, there are certain parts of the world where they use um, really quite... Um, uh, I suppose more ro robust levels of PPE with um, sort of coveralls and uh, even air-powered uh, respirators. Um, 
uh, sort of electronic respirators. But um, UK guidance is that that's um, uh, unnecessary. And actually, our experience using standard UK PHE guidance using a, a respirator, a visor, uh, long sleeve fluid repellent gown, and long gloves, um, we've had a very low level of, of staff um, uh, illness, um, are probably comparable to the population. And uh, our feeling is that our, our staff have been protected by using those measures. What about suctioning? Does it produce aerosols or can you protect against that? I think um, uh, respiratory suctioning is considered an aerosol generating procedure and so you should be using a PPE to, to do that um, and again uh, patients who require that should be isolated or in a cohorted area. Um, so yes, I think um, induced sputum, um, cough assist, uh, respiratory suctioning are all considered aerosol generating procedures. But if you if you go to the CDC or the PHE guidance that I linked to, um, they'll have a, a list of all the different aerosol generating procedures. And so you need to use precautions when you're when you're performing those procedures. Uh, antimicrobials. Do you give them to everybody, uh, just some, and, and which ones do you use and why? So, so in terms of antimicrobials, um, generally speaking, when a patient get ad gets admitted, um, they will be put on to um, community-required pneumonia antibiotics um, until we get a diagnosis of COVID-19. Um, then uh, it's a judgment call, but often we'll stop the antibiotics uh, because often it's uh, COVID-19 as a diagnosis and um, once we get the diagnosis is enough to explain the presentation. If we have a high index of suspicion or they're very unwell we might con continue antibiotics um, uh, or we may start them later on in the course of their illness if we think they have a super added bacterial infection or a ventilator associated pneumonia um, and so uh, I, I, I think it's, it's hard to say hard and fast rules about that um, and different uh, units and different clinicians will probably have different thresholds for when they start and stop antibiotics but as we know we need to be careful about our antibiotic use to try and prevent um, uh, uh, overuse and um, and resistance in in organisms so um, you need to try and have appropriate um, governance about your antibiotic use and so we, we, we decide these things closely with our uh, microbiology colleagues and using our, our, our hospitals um, policies and procedures um, but obviously there's a, an element of clinical judgment in that as well. Just a, a final question now for patients coming off ventilators how, how do you decide uh, when it's right to take them off and w mm -hmm. when uh, having to re reventilate them again uh, yeah. will be unnecessary. So as I said, it can take some, um, some considerable length of time to wean patients. Um, I would say often a week, um, more likely two weeks, and we've had, we've had um, patients for over four weeks um, on a ventilator. And so they're likely to be quite weak at that stage and will need weaning. Um, and uh, if you're an intensivist, a critical care physician, I'm sure you'll be used to that. Um, but there's different approaches to weaning, uh, but you should try and have a system and uh, this evidence base for how you go about weaning patients. Um, COVID-19 patients take some time to wean and they, they can also um, have quite a high failed extubation rate. So even when they look like they're ready to extubate, um, they can, they can and, and you extubate them, they can fail and require reintubation. And that can be as high as, as three quarters of patients. 75% um, of patients need reintubation. So uh, there's a more of a drive to make sure that they're really truly ready. So that would be on something like a CPAP of five or six um, with uh, an oxygen requirement of less than 30%, ideally 25%, and do that for at least 24 hours to make sure they're really, really stable enough to extubate. You also want to make sure that you've done a, a cuff leak um, to make sure that they're, they're, they, they're not, the airway isn't uh, constricted from having the tube down. 
And you might want to give them a, a 24 hours of steroids, dexamethasone, if you think they, they, they don't have a cuff leak and are, are going to have inflamed larynx. Um, then, you, then you proceed, our, our practice is we tend to, to, to extubate them at that stage, um, uh, but there will be a, a, a cohort of patients who require re-intubation because they, they just can't cope off the ventilator or they fail for another reason. Um, uh, so, the urine proposing the malaria they will require tracheostomy at that stage and that's another thing you have to think about in terms of uh, percutaneous or sur surgical tracheostomy and it's it's a, another aerosol generating procedure um, so we've our practice is that we've done that in theatre and we've done surgical tracheostomy so far although other centers are using percutaneous tracheostomy um, uh, but there's there's considerations around that and there's guidance online. There's, uh, there's good quality UK guidance um, from that includes ENT input as well as uh, intensivist and anaesthetist input. Uh, but it's a procedure you need to think carefully about, about how you go about it. Um, so tracheostomy is, is, is a, another uh, consideration when weaning these patients. Well, thank you very much, Dr. James Haslam. The, the questions are still flowing. There are, there are many more, but I'm afraid that we've run out of time, but thank you so much for your time and for this brilliant comprehensive talk and for dealing with our questions so well as well. Please do join us on ICMDA webinars uh, next time. We're running two of these a week at the moment and we'll keep them going as long as they remain uh, popular and people are interested. So thank you very much again. Bye, thanks a lot.